Pleasure to be here from uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History, uh, accompanied by uh, Bob Davidson, the collection manager here in the front, and uh, our crustacean curator, Jim Fetzner, right here, and also the mysterious Bob Acciavati. He's There he is in the back. Uh, he's an unofficial guardian of this event. And um, really uh, excited to be able to uh, talk very briefly, I hope, about the uh, resources that are at Carnegie Museum of Natural History that would relate to this project. Really, I'm going to do probably what most of the rest of you will be doing, and that is just talking very quickly about some small part, particularly strengths and whatever, of what are, in virtually every case, for the InvertNet collaboration, uh, truly uh, huge and often kind of relatively unknown resources for doing all kinds of amazing things. This is a, uh, the, the history of the Carnegie Collection is a, is a complicated one, and I'm just, it's constantly changing, and constantly in problems, you know, it's constantly got issues of staffing and funding, and, you know, like all big standalone museums, it's really, really a challenge. The, the Institute itself goes back to the Carnegie Endowment period, which is in the 1890s, and the museum comes into being as a concept, as a twinkle in the early uh, founder's eyes, uh, actually relatively short time ago, only 1898. And in fact, the building that we live in, which we think is some kind of gigantic art, you know, medieval uh, castle or something, in actual fact was built in uh, 1906, so it's relatively recent, including many of the collections here, are you really older than the Carnegie collection. Just recently, there's been a, um, I guess this is the pointer, is it now? Just recently, very recently, in 2011, there's been a major reorganization of the, of the museum. This is to increase efficiency in communication and, to, and fundability, and for a lot of good reasons that administrators worry about a lot. And uh, in fact, it has given rise now to several new centers uh, for various kinds of museum studies and particularly public programming. There's a Center for World Culture that was just kicked off in, in December. Uh, John Wenzel is a name some of you may recognize as the newly christened director of a Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystems. Uh, there's a new, just, just announced, Center for Evolutionary Studies, which is dominated by the dinosaur people and so forth. Through all this, all these changes and, and whatever have survived the bug rooms at Carnegie Museum, what we call them affectionately, the bug rooms, section of invertebrate zoology or the section of insects and spiders. It goes clear back to the very beginning of the museum. And, and sets a tone. In fact, we often refer to the major power groups that are constantly struggling with each other in the museum's political environment as bugs and bones. And uh, it really is true that the size of the collections, uh, vertebrate paleontological collections, are remarkable, and the size and strength and representation of the insect collections also. Well, very quickly, the history of the, of the, of the uh, collections there fall into three groups, and I won't bore you with the details. They're heavily dominated by the study of Lepidoptera. The founding director of the museum, first chancellor over at the University of Pittsburgh, and a major player with Carnegie for negotiating the endowment and giving the ideas, was a guy named William Jacob Holland. And he starts off this um, effort with an assistant, Paul, who was specializing in urban data, and then followed by a Russian um, uh, kind of an artiste who was also a lepidopterist who took the collections and their staff and whatever down through the Second World War. Uh, then in the Middle Ages, there was 1940 to 1980, there was a, a period of kind of local service where the primary attention of the insect collections and all the collections were, had a parochial focus. They were attempting to address issues right in western Pennsylvania. They thought it was the hometown museum. 
There were some interesting people there. There was a hymenopterist named Wallace, uh, several lepidopterists of which uh, Clench is probably the best known one. He's the co-founder with Charles Remington of the Lepidopter Society. And finally ending it in this middle age period with at the beginning of what we call the Renaissance here, um, with, a, with uh, Ginter Eckes' stay there, which really kicked things off. Ginter, now Weston Opitz at, at KSU, has a, um, has a really strong role for us because of beginning the process of, of reblooming. Uh, and the Renaissance includes some of the players that I mentioned here, Chen Young, who's in Asia right now on some field work, uh, Bob Davidson, who's been the collection manager for years and is in essence the Coleoptera curator, um, Bob Andro, a, a specialist you'll, we'll talk about in a minute, and Jim, of course, here, Jim Fetzner and Chris Station. Then there's a whole bunch of other supporting staff. What the future kingdom will be, I don't know. We'll just have to see. Um, the, the, the trend in the collections has have been to uh, get more and more exotic and more and more kind of unusual, partly because of the uh, uh, dancing age of the participants. Bob, for instance, is no longer just interested in Carabins out his back door, which he dearly loves, or even uh, the Arctic, but is very interested in anything from anywhere. So it's that trend that happens. We are very thankful to resurrect what in the Middle Ages became utter chaos. It's really amazing. Um, I first visited the collection myself as a graduate student from Cornell in 1978. And it was, well, yeah, the word appalling really applies. It was just a massive accumulation of things that were in unrenovated rooms and completely hopeless spaces. Uh, I mean, there were areas called the front 40 of the museum, which was a giant attic which contained the insect. It was just horrible. And uh, to summarize all that I put here, which I won't go over in detail, is NSF really saved our banana. It really did. Because NSF has given us repeatedly, again and again, from the from rent, uh, you know collection renovation monies awards that were critical to getting us to where we are today. In fact, four major awards approaching three million dollars of actual input to us has really changed our lives. Started with a uh, early grant that uh, that uh, uh, Weston wrote in 1980 and we funded in 1981 and built an initial compactor, and then another uh, compactorization effort which brought. Uh, happened in the mid-90s, followed by a one that was largely focused on going after troublesome specimens, types, uh, trying to get things sorted out of boxes and rehoused and whatever in 2000. Then a, then a retrofitting, an unusual retrofitting of our space that was in classical storage by making cabinet inserts, customized cabinet inserts that would hold a large uh, drawers, a, a so-called Holland drawer which is built on the USNM dimensions, but which houses the Lepidopter collections. And uh, that effort continues. We, we have had the very positive blessing of all the best wishes and good reviews from colleagues for literally decades. We really, well, yeah, of course we, are, of course we deserve it. I mean, how could you not say that? But, uh, but it really has been indispensable. Uh, the, 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 the power of federal foundation money uh, in this, uh, theater is really very critical. I mean, we would not be there, period. Um, the museum itself is unable to do more than uh, contemplate its vanishing corporate for, you know, principle of its major endowments. It's really not in a position to spend money on collections. I would say I've outlined here that there are three phases, and we'll call phase four a digitization phase. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the programs are just what you'd expect in a large museum. There's research programs by staff, and we have now in the insect collections over 60 uh, uh, research associates, some of them who are very special to us in terms of taking on the management and handling of whole collections. So it really becomes a, a volunteer effort. We've been very much engaged in biotic inventory, some NSF funded, but a lot of it funded from other restricted accounts that I have at my disposal for invertebrate zoology. And uh, th this has taken us to have major collections from places like the Upper Congo Basin, Malawi, a lot of Afrotropical work because of the nature of the collections at Carnegie. Um, uh, South America, the Andes, the you know, Chen has been now in all the Ks, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, whatever, uh, and Mongolia, and is now working in Taiwan. Uh, Chen Young, who's uh, the a curator of Diptera. And so there's a lot of activity that's ongoing in terms of foreign acquisition. Um, the Hispaniola project was 
particularly exciting because that was NSF monies that enabled us to really accumulate a massive um, amount of material, all of which many people here have worked. Many, every institution has workers that have borrowed and studied and described from this, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. It goes on and on and on. It's one of the things about these uh, biotic inventory things is that it's very hard to bring them down on a convenient grant schedule because a lot of the specialists that you need, the brain power that will handle the material and conduct the revisionary work and provide the names and whatever, are not yet uh, conceived at the point. I mean, literally conceived, they're not organisms yet, until we actually get well into the project. So there's this life after inventory, which is going to be quite devastating. We also do a lot of conservation-oriented research, and we have a thing called the biodiversity facilities, a services facility, which I want to talk about very briefly. Uh, we, uh, this one, when I glanced at this this morning, I noticed that I, that the horrors of tab the limited tables rose up. So I want to actually point out just a couple of things, talking very quickly about uh, the size of the collection and its various strengths. Um, if you align this column here of non lepidopter with the total number of USNM drawers that are in the collection, not specimens, you see that you have, for total non lepidopter about 39% of the collection. And for the 18,000, and these numbers are 2009 numbers, and acquisition has been absolutely blatant in the last six months for us. So we're now talking up between 32 and 35,000 drawers, uh, a rich mix of all orders, not just Lepidopter. In fact, we're a little cautious about Lepidopter because of the size. That's 61% of the resource. Now let me just interpret that for you in terms of InvertNet's goals right now, is that it's really kind of off-market because that huge Lepidoptera resource, I mean, that's, when you think Carnegie, it's massive world coverage for Lepidoptera. And uh, it's really not exploited, and it won't be exploited uh, in this project. We've kind of left that on the side table. However, there will be moments late at night when some old Lepidopters might wander in and try out the equipment on some special challenges. And now that I've met John and some of the other technical people here, I'm excited about that interaction. Uh, the other message that comes from this tab delimited, um, uh, delimited morass here that I'm showing you is the distribution of the collection. This is what's really unusual. You already knew that there was a lot of moths and butterflies at, at Carnegie. You probably didn't appreciate that these were from strange places all over the world, representing many new taxa, you know, just the usual richness. Uh, but what most people don't remember or realize is the distribution of these numbers are, are actually in line down here, where I'm talking about the distribution of pinning surface area or the pin collection in terms of the percentage of the collection that's represented from different areas. And here's the take home message is there's 34% of the collection is the Arctic material. If you're worried that Carnegie has a total collection size, we estimate the collection size to be around 9,000, 9.1, I'm sorry, 9.1 uh, million specimens with an upper bound of all the unprepared, you know, zooming off into some wild estimate of 19 million or something, not a real number. Uh, but the 9 million, and especially the 7 million that are in a condition that can actually be moved, pen material that can be moved to a donor, I'm sorry, to a loan or to an active worker, uh, those, are the, those are the kinds of specimens that add to the strength of the collection greatly. And the, uh, so you see those numbers, and I just emphasize that 13% of the collection is Afrotropical. This means in actual fact Carnegie kind of sitting there quietly in Pittsburgh is really probably in terms of species representation and the like in many groups, the African collection and has a special strength. And we augment that. We've had expeditions and collections and efforts in Ghana, in Cameroon, and we continue to quietly augment and add material from the Afrotropic. Let me go, so we got those two messages. There's two damn many Lepidoptera at Carnegie for our purposes here. And uh, there's a lot of African stuff. In fact, your collections, even if you're half the size of us, might be larger than us for domestic purposes, for, for the Arctic representation. I want to look at loan activity. This has been, these are numbers just tallied over the years and have student representation and whatever, but if you took a total number of loans that were made in the last five year period, ending in 2009, which is where I have intact numbers, uh, we, have a, we have a total of 246 loans, which is actually historically down for us. We, we would have expected it to be near double that number, but our activity was just less, in, especially in that uh, economic period uh, in 2008, 2009. 
And uh, we have the total number of loans from the history of the institution is 3,000 insect loans, and about a million bugs have departed the, the collections and returned. Most of them have returned, not all of them have returned. Um, and that gives us uh, a, a really interesting figure, which is to actually go in and calculate over a century of activity what the impact of the NSF renovations that began in 1980 were. And it's, it's like 70 or greater, probably closer to 75% of the actual specimen used by experts has leveraged, been leveraged by NSF. Would not have happened. Literally would not have happened. We were too big to ever become an orphan. You know, you can't get a great big fat guy uh, and make him into a, a, a appropriate source of, of, you know, your charity as a, you know, as an orphan. So, uh, you, you know, I don't know what would have happened to that collection. Let's uh, take a look at scientific visitation. This has been really remarkable. People have come and then come back again and again. And these are the visitors that are actually in there. Over a five-year period, we had 380 visits, 297 visitors, a total of 968 working days, visitor days in the collections. Now, that's about half or a third of what it actually ought to be, but we are kind of isolated. But it's still a huge amount of labor and input uh, to the collections. Uh, publications are the interesting thing here is the richness of, of student publications. We've averaged uh, uh, 20 over the last, uh, over that period, 2005, 2009, uh, 28 publications that are using Carnegie as a primary source. And uh, we have our own publication series, of course, which has in, in recent years been publishing more and more larger revisionary works. Uh, we've done a number of people's dissertations and larger things in the annals of the Carnegie Museum. Uh, but this is all publications, and you can see it comes to a lot of pages. I'm not sure this kind of compilation of data, which is chaired Bob Davidson prematurely gray, uh, is, is worth it in the long run. But it does occasionally make the point that, you know, there is a permanent record that results from all this bug love. All this kind of interaction with the specimens and the sorting and handling of the collections actually ends up with a, a permanent testimonial in the form of, of those kinds of products, published products. We look forward to the power of InvertNet and, and all of its uh, uh, affiliated members uh, in this way. Um, here's the growth of the collections. These are numbers I don't often share because uh, my own administration is often a little hesitant about the rate of growth uh, that the bug groups manifest. And, uh, but you can see that it isn't that enormous. People who think that, that we actually are acquiring a lot of huge numbers of specimens, not really true. If you look up here, you'll see that on average, over that period of time, we had about 52,000 specimens per year, pinned specimens new. A lot of those are prepared, 45,000 of them were prepared by staff. Uh, we have 8,000, th these numbers here were for non-labs. For labs, it's only 8,000. But trust me, if you get a donated collection that has 60, 70,000 in it one year, then that number goes up. Uh, and of course, you have these bulk collections which are totally invaluable, but almost impossible to get at or to take advantage of, but nobody wants to throw them out. Usually few uh, trap residues in fluids. And those give us an estimate of something like, we probably are taking in like a million bucks a year, uh, most of which are not real. Probably on, on something less than 100,000 a year are real. Okay, um, very quickly, some strengths of the collection. Uh, Lepidoptera, of course, who are not interested. Coleoptera. Uh, Caravity and Serambicity, both pretty, uh, especially Caravity, just a remarkable, uh, uh, well, it's a testimonial to the power of Bob here, who spent a full adult life working and building an international <coughs> resource for Caravids. And so now uh, we have virtually every serious Caravid worker on the planet has made the pilgrimage to, to see Bob and the Caravid collection, and it's growing like mad. We just recently acquired the, the completely never to be replaced again. Tom Barr collection of North American cave karatidae, and it's it's just a totally amazing thing. Another very large serambicid collection is coming our way just in the last week or so. So we are, we are still trying to quietly augment those collections. The the by a historical quirk, the story of which I will tell you off offline, we end up with perhaps the most species rich accumulation of Siphonaptera in existence. This is a a long story. We had no direct interest in, in fleas, but we ended up with the, our own substantial collections added to that of Robert Traub's collection, and it really has been a major workout for us. It's a totally amazing resource, and it is one that will be 
captured the, 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 the Arctic parts of it captured. It's not that big. It's just under 100,000 glass slides. It has about 30,000 unmounted fleas in fluids. It has uh, about 93, 95% of the known world species, many undescribed species. And it has had wonderful service from the siphonopter community, especially in North America, but also in Europe, in terms of people borrowing and studying. And in fact, we look forward with great eagerness to a manuscript produced uh, just recently by Bob Lewis from Iowa on the fleas of North America, which we'll attempt to publish in the either the Bulletin or the Annals of Carnegie Museum. This is a major compendium work, fully illustrated. It'll be an amazing testament to the, to the collection and to, of course, Bob Lewis, who is such a contributor. Here's a Tefulid collection, which is, of course, anywhere you can find Tefulids that have legs, that's a remarkable collection. <laughs> uh, I invite anyone who's driving through Pittsburgh to see one of the seven wonders of the world, which is stop in and take a peek at Chen's Tefulids. These are all hand processed in the field or relaxed and processed. It's a totally gorgeous collection. And it's truly international. And he is one of the stealth operators for Polly Bear in the Barcode of Life scheme. They've got thousands and thousands worldwide. So he's, they're coming at some very interesting kind of what happens when you take a group like Tepulids, which nobody knows. Even with the largest family of diptera and 10,000 species, what, what happens when you turn your collection loose and really go after this with the barcodes to supplement? They're going to have some interesting, interesting stuff. Um, there's a small collection of, of the classic Ortman collection there, but it's been growing. And Jim is wherever there is a wherever there is a, a crawdad that's out there and of interest, uh, including Australian material and so forth. Uh, uh, he is adding to the collections. The historical type holdings in many orders are significant. Carnegie uh, about 4,200 known primary types, a count of about 34,000, a little more than 34,000 secondary types. We estimate those numbers to be about 80% of what the total would be for types. So we're, we're probably looking at something like 5,000 primaries, neo, lecto, and, and uh, holotypes, uh, which uh, in some groups is amazing. In the Spingidae, for instance, the hawk moths, you know, it's narrowly second in type richness to the British Museum with, what, 460 or something like that uh, primary types. Uh, I'm going I'm to go in this in a little detail, and Chris, I'm probably over my limit. But what's new? Well, um, uh, I'm getting close to the end here. I want to talk about the, what we would like to see from, from everyone here and your extended family of specialists that can produce credible IDs. It's really verification of ID as well as the initial ID on materials that you're going to data capture is really whether you make it or don't make it. Because at some point along the way, you say goodbye to the specimen and you trust the data. And then the rest of it, a lot of it is discussion about how you refine the data that you actually captured, how you expand it and interpret it, and get the right, you know, get the right uh, uh, Buena Vista in the right country, which is not always easy. Um, so uh, in that regard, we are really concerned about how we're going to attack this problem of ID verification. Uh, at Carnegie, and I would hope that others would do this similar operation, what I call the pre-digitization ID need. Uh, not so much curatorial need, if you use curation as an organizational kind of meaning, uh, but we use it in the broad sense, meaning authoritative ID and organization of the collections according to some system. Um, and these are some of the groups that really struck us in, in this region that need attention. Odinates, we're not really ready. We have the Odinates, but we really aren't ready. They're not processed. They're one of our last big kind of frontiers to get into envelopes and to make it into conventional storage. They're not really ready. Lepidoptera are ready by the millions, but, uh, but this is not on this grant. Trichoptera, are, we have a major resource there for many local surveys and activities. And Trichoptera, we really need work. Ollie Flint has come to see us several times and work on the collection and has left big tracks, but it's nothing like what really needs to be done. Incidentally, my remarks here are primarily in the Arctic. So the situation differs widely when you move outside to the Africa or to the Neotropics. Um, we, we have a wonderful uh, curation of, of Neuroptera. That's going to be a real asset. And they're largely done, except for the hemorrhabeas. We need the hemorrhabeas to be processed. But we, things like Mermeliontids and um, Chrysopids and whatever are all done. Um, Necoptera, we need somebody to work on Panorbidae. Uh, I don't know that you've ever tried to identify one of those things to species, but it starts out being, oh, this is going to be like two minutes. And uh, you, you end up not getting the ID. Um, in Coleoptera, major groups, you, you already know them. Staphyliniforms, 
uh, curculionoids. Um, the Chrysomelids for us, huge collection, uh, 110, 120,000 specimens, not, not, not what it ought to be for digitization. Elaterids, where's Paul? Somebody's in here on the Elaterid guy. Uh, a huge number of Elaterids, and it's kind of an interesting story. The, most of the world Elaterid collections have been done by various specialists. So there's an Italian doing a little here, and somebody doing Africa, and some. It's weird. It ends up in a situation where the, the Arctic collection is the one that really isn't identified and, it, and has, you know, how many tenisser can you stack on the head of a pen? Or are those three Ampedus really color morphs or what? You know, that story. Um, and then in Hemiptera, we, we had a little trouble uh, knowing what's good because the Cicadella people have been so assiduous, really not a lot. But we have collections, substantial collections that are actually out borrowed that we would like to see database under this effort. You know what I'm talking about, but especially in membracity, uh, we the, there are elements there that we need to have done. And Jim Slater, bless his soul, uh, did the world ideas for us. But again, in in pick beetle fashion, not the uh, uh, not the uh, the Arctic material. So we really need some attention in some of those groups. Others are well ready to be done. Uh, in Hymenoptera, it's just what you might expect. It's ichneumonoidia. So who else has that problem? And uh, if we stop collecting ichneumonoids, not my chart, you'd say, no, don't, don't, don't stop collecting the Burkhanas, you know, but it is a challenge. And finally, in Nicara, we're in pretty good shape with some large collections uh, that, that have been processed and are ID'd and are appropriate to this project. Uh, some of that's heavy lifting because they're very accurate ID, but very small series. So you're adding a species with a single record or two or three records. So the, the Muscomorpha, not the sarcophagids so much and the califorids, but the muscoids and anthemaeids and stuff like that represent a real challenge to get identified. These are big groups, big families that need attention. I'm sure you'll have your own list of this, but that's kind of what quickly we did a little thought group and, and, uh, and came up with that list. Um, the, the, the history of digitization, and then I'll shut up, Chris, is, um, is at Carnegie is really not. Uh, it's, it's both, it's a mixed bag. It, it ends up where early in the history of the museum for the country, Carnegie vertebrate collections and whatever were one, some of the first, the bird collection, a huge collection, herb collections and whatever, were ones that got uh, digitized. They got, they got database, they got data captured. And uh, so it was uh, pretty exciting, but the insects were into acquisition. And so there's not that much activity at all until the 1990s when we began to do structured projects for federal agencies, Forest Service, uh, USDA. We began to do these in some state agencies, and when we did those, we devised a mechanism by which we could handle 40, 50, 60,000 new specimens and maybe a couple thousand species represented in a, in a serious survey where we had the data to handle that. And that kind of all ended up in Lotus's lap and then that migrated to Excel, and then that moved over in the, the mid-1990s to what all the rest of the collections were using, the Borland paradox, and then just kind of died, just kind of didn't go. Kept gathering data, kept putting in, to this very day, keep putting data in, every, there are one or more persons working on this every single day.